you know, I didn't really get into it. I said, what am I doing here? You know, you know Matt, Matt. Uh, hey, Matt. Matt. Hey, hey. Hey. What's up, Molly? What you go underneath? Yeah. Bill, will you start? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Uh, guys, will go ahead and get started. Uh, Coach Maneri is uh, getting mic'd up. There he is, there he is now. And uh, again, welcome. Thanks for joining us for our virtual 2021 Baseball Media Day. Uh, Coach will speak from now until about 1230. He'll make a few remarks and we'll open up to your questions. And then getting at 1230, we'll have uh, nine different players come at 10-minute intervals. So it should carry us until about 2 o'clock. So we'll go ahead and begin with Coach Maneri entering his 15th season here at LSU. He also enters the year as the winningest active coach in NCAA Division I baseball. Coach Maneri. Well, once again, uh, a first for the last calendar year. How much I miss having you all here today so we could provide a nice lunch for you and get a chance to say hello to you all individually. But as, uh, as we've had to make a habit out of doing, we're adapting and doing the best we can with everything. So you guys are a little bit more used to these press conferences on Zoom than I am with the other sports. But uh, it's good to be with everybody. Today's an exciting day, to say the least. It's a beautiful day. Uh, Chamber of Commerce Day, as my good friend Jordy Holberg just told me. Uh, it's a, it's, it, we're going to have a beautiful day to get everything done that we want to get done. We're going to simulate a, uh, we're going to simulate February 19th as best we can with our pregame batting practice, pregame infield, scrimmage game. We've got all three flags up out behind center field. The players will be in game uniforms for the first time. Uh, we'll have umpires. The field will be lined like it would be on a game day and, uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully the guys will respond well and be excited about being out there and, and then it'll take a little bit of the nerves away from what they normally would feel on uh, opening day, which is February 19th against the Air Force Academy. So uh, we're excited. I, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled about the way our team is looking thus far. Uh, it's been well chronicled. We have a very veteran pitching staff. You know, we lost Eric Walker and we lost Cole Henry from last year's team. But I believe that Jaden Hill has the capability of stepping in and picking up for Cole Henry as a, as a big time starting pitcher. The, I think we're going to see him continue to improve as the season goes on. Uh, obviously, Landon Marceau and A.J. Labus give us a veteran rotation. Uh, and then we've got so many guys coming out of the bullpen that have had experience with us and done a tremendous job. And when you add that, to some of the young freshman pitchers. The pitching staff it gives us so much to be excited about. Position player wise, we're probably as young as our, as our pitchers are veteran, uh, but that's not scaring me at all because I think we have a very talented group of position players and I'm excited about them. And uh, the, 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 as the season goes on and the more experience that they gain, I just believe that they're going to continue to get better and better. And uh, I just think our team is, is primed to, to be one of the top teams in the SEC. That it's a good, the SEC is going to be as tough as it's ever been, if not tougher, because so many schools like us have had players return or not get drafted because of the shortened draft. And so the talent level in the SEC is going to be extreme. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how many first-round pitchers are going to come out of the SEC, but I wouldn't be surprised if if they're, you know, a third of the first round is, uh, is SEC pitchers or position players. So it's going to be an exciting season. Uh, today is uh, three weeks from opening day, and uh, we've got three weeks to get, get everything tightened up a little bit and get ready to start our non-conference segment of our schedule. Without any, any uh, more comments, I'll be happy to start taking questions. Bill, are we a go? We are. Okay. Coach, David from Rivals.com. Coach, my, I have two questions. One, which in regards to Jaden Hill, 
Over the last two years, how have you learned better to manage his arm to where he can be the kind of player you want, you know, come end of SEC play and into the postseason? And then my other one is about Dylan Cruz. How do you manage expectations with him being a highly touted freshman, or are you just let him just come in and do his thing? Well, let's talk about Jaden first, David, okay? Uh, you know, when, when Jaden was in high school up in Arkansas, he played third base a lot and pitched. He told me he hardly ever threw a bullpen session when he was in high school. So all of a sudden he comes to college, we decide he, just, he wanted to just focus on pitching. We, we all felt that that was the right thing to do. And of course, Alan Dunn has his throwing program that he develops the pitchers with and it's been extremely successful through the years. And we've hardly really had injuries throughout the years with, with the way that Alan has handled those guys. But, but for Jaden, it was a little bit much for what he had been used to in high school. And so the adjustment was pretty dramatic for him. He started the first two weekends of his freshman year and then went down with a sore arm. There was nothing structurally wrong with his arm. We did multiple MRIs, et cetera. It was just a matter of the muscles getting used to the, to the quantity of throwing that required of a college pitcher. Last year, it was a very concerted effort on Alan and I, along, I, I should say, with Corey Couture, our trainer, to bring him along slowly in the spring. So we put him into the bullpen. We managed very carefully how many pitches he threw, how many innings he threw, with the idea that we would stretch him out as the year went on. The intention was to start him out in the bullpen, and then ultimately he might have moved into the rotation. Of course, the season got ended before we could, we could uh, realize that that expectation. This year, I, I, there's no real holding him back. He, he's going to start the season in the, ro in the rotation. We may hold him back a little bit more than what Marso and Labus do, just because those guys are such veterans and have done it so much. Whereas like opening weekend, for example, say Marso and Labus went five innings if they pitched effectively enough, we may not have he'll go quite that long and just constantly be building it up. I really want the kid to feel confident not only in his ability to succeed and dominate, but also to feel that he's healthy. So rather than push him too much early, we might just take it a little bit slower than we do with the other guys. And I think he's going to be fine. He's probably the best athlete on our team, and there's no reason why he shouldn't have the endurance uh, and you know to be able to stretch it out. But we just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. If everything goes according to plan, he should have 19 starts. You know, you got 14 in the regular season. You've got the SEC tournament, a regional, super regional, and hopefully a couple starts in Omaha. So, you know, the first weekend of the weekend of the season is not going to make or break her, his season, and we want to be careful about that. Your next question, David, was about Dylan Cruz. Hey, listen, I could sit here and talk all day about Dylan. Dylan is one of those kids that you get to come. That, that arrives at LSU and you know there's something different about him. LeMayu had that same aura. Bregman had that aura. You know, Duplantis had that aura and so forth. Not only is Dylan an extremely talented player, but he has a tremendous attitude. He's as coachable as anybody we have. He works as hard as anybody we have. Uh, you, can, you can coach him hard if you want to. There's hardly ever a need to because the kid is so in love with the game and you know he has the Bregman qualities as far as his passion for the game. I tell him he has Bregman's passion but he's got LeMayu's swing. <laughs> he hits the ball with such authority to the opposite field and uh, he, the other day he hit a home run off A.J. Labus in a simulated game about halfway up the stands in right field, opposite field. You don't, you don't see right-handed hitters hit him like that very frequently. So this kid has a lot of talent. Now, of course, LSU fans, when you start promoting guys like this, they expect a the guy to hit 100 home runs and bat 500 and never make an out. We got to keep reminding ourselves he's an 18-year-old youngster, and he's going to have some days. The, the game is a humbling game, and he's going to have days, and, and one of the things he's, he's going to have to learn to do, because he hasn't had a lot of failure in his career, is be able to manage the failure without losing confidence and so forth. But I'm, I, I would not be surprised at all because of the maturity level of this kid that he's going to be fine. Uh, just like uh, you guys have been putting questions in the chat, so let's go 
wouldn't do it that way. Uh, okay. Let's go to uh, Glenn West with the next question. Hello, Glenn. Hey, Paul. Uh, you know, you mentioned um, some of the new guys that we could see out in the uh, out in the field. I'm just curious, who who are a couple of those guys that could you know really show something early on uh, this season? And I also just wanted to ask about Trey Morgan. You know, he was somebody that we heard a lot about in the fall. Um, about his potential and his future at like first base. Can you just, just talk a little bit about him and how exciting his promises? Well, you pretty much answered your own question, Glenn. <laughs> uh, Trey Morgan is a kid to really be excited about. Gosh, do I love this kid. Uh, I had no idea he was this good when, when we recruited him, but he's a tremendous ball player. I've coached now, this will be my 39th year. I would put him in a category of maybe five first basemen that I've coached in my entire lifetime as far as his defensive skill around first base. He, 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 I, told him, I, I told him yesterday, you might be the first left-handed throwing shortstop in the history of the SEC if I have enough courage to do that someday. But he has those kind of glove skills, uh, you know, to be able to pick the ball and so forth. So I'm, I, in all honesty, I'm a little bit concerned about the left side of our infield defensively. We've got some work to do there. But one of the things that gives me confidence is knowing that Trey Morgan's over at first base because the throw doesn't have to be chest high for it to be an out. He's, gonna, he's got not only the ability to pick balls in the dirt, but he's also got a wingspan where he can leap, reach, stretch his footwork on the bag to be able to give maximum distance to be able to stretch for a ball. He's just got great instinct over there. And oh, by the way, he's probably going to hit second or third in our order. So that'll tell you what a tremendous uh, potential I think he has as a hitter as well. And another just great kid, like uh, the same qualities I talked about with Dylan Cruz as far as his love of the game, his work ethic, his coachability. There's no prima donna in either one of those kids. I tell you, they are all team oriented and they just want to want to be good baseball players for us. I'm real excited about some other freshmen, Glenn. Uh, Brody Drost out of Barb High School, I think, is a, a young, budding Greg Dykeman type player. Um, Will Safford out of U High. I always I have to catch myself from saying little Will Safford because I say that affectionately because uh, you know I can look him eye to eye. But Will played safety on a state championship team at U High, so you know he's tough as nails and. I've used this comparison before, uh, a left-handed hitting Tyler Hanover for people that have followed LSU baseball through the years. He's just a baseball rat. And whether you put him in center field, whether you put him at third base, second base, wherever you put him, he's going to play just as hard as he can and do a really good job. And, and I'm excited about him. Um, Jordan Thompson is an infielder that I feel very good about, and I think he's going to continue to improve. I don't know if these next three weeks he'll be completely ready to, to jump right in there or not. Um, the, the talent is there, there's just inconsistencies right now, and he's got to work on those. The sooner he's able to, to do so, I think the better his chance will be to be in there rather quickly. So I think those five position players are, are the, the top guys that we see. Um, from a pitching staff standpoint, I'll tell you, uh, I'm so excited about Garrett Edwards and Will Helmers. And they were probably not the high, most highly touted guys we brought in coming out of high school, but they just pitched. They, but both of them have three pitches that they can control. They throw just hard enough to be able to be competitive with their fastball, but because they have really good off-speed pitches and command, it makes their fastball play a little bit harder. Um, but Ty Floyd has come back from Georgia and uh, from the Christmas vacation. I think he's made a lot of improvement, uh, as has Blake Money. Blake is really getting himself into great shape, and, and this kid is a personality that's, you know, just as wide as the Mississippi River Bridge. He's a Todd Peterson number two, if you know what I'm saying about that. Uh, so we, we've, we've got some good, young, talented players that, that I, I'm not going to be afraid to use them, and we're going to count on them. And I think the more they play, the better they're going to get. All right, uh, next question from uh, Jacques. Jacques Doucet. Hey, Coach. Good morning. Good morning, Jacques. How you doing? Not doing uh, bad. How about yourself? Not too bad. Uh, how many pounds are you down now? <laughs> <laughs> I've been running every morning. I want to look better in a uni. I take care of myself. 
There you go. Coach, um, last year, I mean, whatever last year was, uh, so through 17 games, you were batting 253 as a team, and I'm looking at those names. A lot of those names you're going to be counting on again this year, you know, removing Cabrera from that. Uh, how did you feel about the way you were moving offensively last year? Obviously, you never got to play in SEC, and the weather didn't heat up and all that stuff, but uh, what, what, what are your expectations for a lot of those guys? from last year, this well, year often. Well, that 252 was with a splurge at the end, by the way, okay? The last three or four games, we swung the bat well. Let me tell you something. If you could stick around and watch the way Eddie Smith works with these guys, it would give you a lot of optimism. Eddie is now in his second year with us, and he, he has worked these guys like you wouldn't believe. And, and I see the improvement each and every day guys that were on our team last year, you know, guys like, uh, uh, well, Kay Doty, for example. Kay Doty started out the season last year. He was hitting a lot of balls hard right at people, and so his numbers were not good through the first, I don't know, 10 games of the season or so. And then all of a sudden the hits started falling for him. He wasn't hitting the ball any better. They just were finding holes. And I think he got his average up to around 270 or so. This past summer, Cade went away and hit 420 in the collegiate summer league he was at. This fall, he led our team in hitting. So I think you're going to see guys like Cade Doty be a lot better. I thought Cade Beloso was not quite as good as he was as a freshman. I think we're going to see him blossom this year. He's in great condition. He's been you know, walloping balls out of the ballpark daily in batting practice, showing that power that he demonstrated in his freshman year. Gavin Dugas is coming on great. Uh, I think Giovanni De Giacomo is going to be a real wild card. If we can, and if Eddie can get him to just be a little bit more consistent, you know, he ended up hitting 350, I think, and led our team. But the extremes were way up here and the extremes were way here as well. If we could try to get it a little bit more consistent, his speed is such a great asset that if he can just put the ball in play, he's going to make more things happen. So, uh, so, you know, I think, I think some of those veteran guys, I think, are, are going to be better. Um, Malazzo's working hard. So is Hayden Travinsky. I think there's going to be, you know, some improvement out of both of them offensively. But the thing that's going to give us a better offensive team as well, Jacques, is going to be these young freshmen that I just talked about. Don't be surprised if you see Morgan and Cruz hitting in critical spots in the order right out of the gate. I'm not, I'm not going to be afraid to throw them right into the fire. All right, uh, next question from Wilson Alexander. Is it my turn? Hey, hey, Wilson, yes. Fire oh, away. Hi. Good. Oh, somebody, somebody just walk around in the sensor. We'll knock it, bring it right back on. <laughs> there we go. I know my champions oh. club. <laughs> yeah. um, this is, as far as I can tell, going to be you know, because y'all are trying to play a normal structure to your season, one of the first attempts to really do that since the pandemic started, at least in college. Um, what are going to be the challenges of getting through that, and kind of how do you plan to sort of approach, you know, being able to play 56 games in the midst of what's still a pandemic? Well, first of all, Wilson, it, it took us a long time to get to the point that we decided to do this. Uh, we started talking, as um, I say we, the 14 SEC coaches, along with the administration of the Southeastern Conference, we started talking about this way back in November, I believe, and we, we literally had a Zoom call about every two weeks. And we looked at every possibility from 14 weeks of four-game weekend series, SEC games only, so an entire 56-game schedule. The problem with doing that is the RPI is so important in how they judge teams in baseball for bids, for re regional hosts, for national seeds. And when you don't play non-conference games and you're virtually just playing each other, it affects your RPI in a very negative way. Literally half your teams will be under 500. The winning team might only win 60% of their games, and there's no RPI gain because assuming you can win the majority of your games against non-conference teams, then they're, they're comparing you to other conferences. And so we all kind of came back to the conclusion that let's give it a shot and see if we can do it. Now, we've ha we, everybody's had games canceled. Illinois canceled a three-game series with us. The Big Ten's doing conference only. Just last week, Cal Riverside canceled a three-game series with us. We replaced Illinois with University of Texas San Antonio. Um, 
we replaced Cal Riverside with a combination of Youngstown State and Nichols State. Um, we, you know, uh, Lamar called and canceled a midweek game with us. Army canceled the first weekend with us. Baylor ended up calling us and asking if they could jump into the weekend with us with UTSA because they had had two different teams cancel a three-game series with them, so we've tried to accommodate them. It's really been amazing to see how coaches around the country are trying to help each other out and work with each other, and so we have some unique scheduling things. So we, anyway, the schedule is mapped out now, and now it's a, the challenge is to get through the schedule. And Wilson, listen, like there was saying in a movie, uh, there's only two certainties that I know. There is a God, and I'm not him, okay? So I can't predict what's going to happen with these kids, but we have constantly are appealing to them about the sacrifices and the protocol that they need to make. And, um, you know, we're not, you know, our team is a microcosm of society. It, you know, we've dealt with some COVID issues. We're continuing to deal with them. And I'm sure other teams are as well. So we're prepared. We're preparing our team to have greater depth, greater versatility, so that if all of a sudden a, a guy or two gets knocked out, that we can almost seamlessly replace that player with somebody that's prepared so that we can continue to have a very competitive team. And then we also have a roster of other teams that we know that we can call on a spur of a moment. If we wake up on Monday morning and a midweek team calls me and says we can't come tomorrow night, then I'm going to you know, blast out phone calls and text messages to other teams in the state and see if somebody can jump in and replace them, you know, just in for the next day or Wednesday, play on Wednesday type of thing. We play a sport that it's not, you know, like scouting is not as critical as it is like in football or basketball where you need a few days to prepare to play that opponent. In baseball, it's, it's different. I mean, scouting has its value, don't get me wrong, but you don't need three or four days to prepare to play an opponent. So, you know, if we have to change something very quickly, we'll, we won't hesitate to do that in hopes to get all 56 in. Okay. hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, we've got about a little less than 10 minutes, so I, I want to get everyone in here to ask for a question. I'll keep my answer shorter. Okay. Uh, let's go, uh, we'll, we'll go to uh, Scott, Jerry, Ed, and Andrew, and I'll wrap it up. So, uh, Scott Radwell. Uh, hey, Rob. I like how you snuck in that uh, quote from Rudy. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, first, of, first of all, how, how is your health? How, how are you feeling physically and maybe compared to, you know, last season or, or in the past? And second of all, obviously there's a lot of reason, it sounds like a lot of reason to be excited about the players you have returning and the new players. But everyone, every roster is stacked, it, it seems like, uh, in the SEC and college baseball. From what you've seen across the country, how, how demanding, how arduous is it going to be? To try to, uh, to to win win the SEC, much less win you know go to, to Omaha in the College World Series this year. Well, thank you for asking about my health, Rab. I feel great. Um, you know, I passed my COVID test yesterday. I get tested weekly. I've never not had COVID, and all my tests have been negative. So we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Uh, I had surgery on my neck back in November for second cervical spine surgery in 11 months. I'm still kind of dealing with, you know, the, the after effects of that, some headaches and those kinds of things. But relatively, I'm feeling pretty good for a 63-year-old man. Um, as far as the competition in the SEC and across the country, listen, the college baseball just keeps getting stronger all the time. And this might be the strongest talent-wise it's been maybe in a few decades. You know, a few decades ago, there were a lot of rules that were in place that allowed for college baseball to really flourish. And then a lot of rules in the NCAA were put in that started to limit what you could do and teams and so forth. Um, but because of the shortened draft, because of the getting an extra year of eligibility, because of the increased rosters being allowed, although the scholarships didn't change, I do think that more teams are going to be more talented than ever before. We're used to this in the SEC. We're, we're, you know, you just have to be a chameleon and you've got to adapt to what is there. It's the same for everybody. So there's not going to ever be any excuses uttered from anybody at LSU. We're just going to keep our standards high. We're going to go out there and compete as hard as we can each and every day. 
and I think we've got a chance to be as competitive as anybody. Hey, Coach. Uh, Devin Fontenot has been on a roll. He's been racking up preseason first-team first, uh, first All-American accolades. You had mentioned back in the fall that uh, he had thrown like a major league bullpen type of bullpen at that sort of level. Um, has he locked in his place as the closer? And if so, how much confidence do you have in him going forward? It, it's amazing that a kid that is a preseason All-American and has done the things that Devin has done can seem to be underrated by most people. You know, people want to emphasize, you know, one poor outing or one inconsistent outing or whatever you want to call it. But Devin is now a fourth-year player. He can throw the ball up to 95 miles an hour. His slider's better. His command's outstanding. He has such a better understanding of what he is as a pitcher and what Alan Dunn and I expect out of him. Absolutely, he's our closer. Um, there's no question about that, and I expect him to have a big year. I thought he was on his way to having a great year last year when it got cut short, but he can't do it alone. He's going to need a lot of help in that bullpen. You know, we're going to have, as you know, a veteran rotation, and assuming Jaden Hill, you know, runs with that job and does a great job. But if your starting pitcher goes out there and pitches you five to seven great innings, you got to have somebody that can handle the last two or three innings of the game. So not having a good bullpen can ruin a season. But I feel confident in our bullpen, not just in Fontenot, but Matthew Beck and Mikhail Hilliard and Aaron George and, and um, all those guys that, I know I'm forgetting a couple of guys, Trent Wittmeyer. The, these guys are veteran guys, and I think some of these freshman arms are really going to surprise people. And we even got a junior college kid by the name of Alex Brady that I think is going to help us a lot. He's a little bit of a Chris Cotton clone uh, from the way he pitches, but I think, uh, I think our staff's going to be solid and, and it needs to be. If you want to compete in this league, you better have a great pitching staff. Okay, we're trying to get a uh, Let's go to uh, Ed Daniels. Ed? Uh, people. I'm going to people to get home. Can, somebody hasn't muted themselves, I think. There you go. Thank you. Is Ed still on? Yeah. Ed, you're muted. Sorry about that. That's um, okay. Paul, um, when you get to a weekend series in the SEC, your starting pitching is so important. I don't know if this is the right term, but based on where we might be with COVID, will you hide guys or will you – you know, how do you make sure that, that you keep those guys uh, clean as far as being able to pitch Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Well, that's a good challenge, Ed. It's going to be the, it's like having the quarterback of your football team. If he, if he goes down with COVID, you better have a good backup. So, you know, we're, we're just going to, look, you can't be with these kids 24 hours a day. All you can do is appeal to them to do the things that we think give them the least chance to catch it. And, and that is, you know, to spend a lot of time in their apartment, keep their social groups small, make sure they're wearing their masks, go through drive throughs to get their food, and that kind of thing. And, you know, hopefully, the, the, you know, we'll have good fortune with it. But I don't, I don't think you can, you know, quarantine a guy to a degree where you can absolutely guarantee his health. And we're just going to hope for the best and plan as best we can. And if somebody does go down, listen, if, if Hill or Fontenot or, or excuse me, Hill, well, Fontenot, if Hill or Marceau or Labus or Fontenot, those guys caught it and, and, and were put on the shelf for a little while, then somebody else is going to have to step up and do the job. How, you just got to treat it as though somebody had an injury and you've got to care about their health, that they come back to health soon and they recover. But in the meantime, you got to get the job done with the guys that are left for you. And that's the attitude that we're going to take as a team. Coach, Andrew Clay, KATC in Lafayette. I wanted to ask you, I know what happened last March is certainly not ideal and everything that got shut down, but now that you look back 10 months later, can you find any silver linings? No. <laughs> no. I just feel terrible for the kids that they, they missed out on an entire season. And the, not only our kids, but the guys that were high school seniors or second year junior college players. And it, it's been an, Andrew, it's been an awful thing for everybody to deal with. And 
I think the one silver lining to I give you an answer to your question is that our players will never take anything for granted again. You have something taken away from you, maybe it increases your love of that particular thing and you don't take it for granted ever again. Okay, uh, last question from Scooter Hobbs. Scooter? Whoa, well, we can't have a press conference without Scooter Hobbs, come on. Hey, uh, you're looking at your roster, you, you got more players in the football team. Uh, hey, uh, Scooter, our, 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 Scooter's time out. Our roster is only 38 guys. It's only three above what we normally would have. Well, it, 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 I don't know. It just looks like more. Does, does that present a challenge, dealing with that many kids? Well, like I said, it's only three more than we, than we normally have. We've got a couple of guys that aren't available right now because they're nursing injuries. So you, you get down to 35 that way. And, hey, listen, you know, the the, the, the the, the good problem to have as a coach is when you have to make tough decisions between good players on who you're going to utilize. The bad problems is when you have to make decisions between players that aren't as talented. So it, it's part of the game. I've been making tough decisions for a lot of years. Uh, the best way to deal with things is just to be upfront and honest with players, and that's what I've tried to do. And, um, you know, but you can only play nine at a time, ten including the pitcher, I guess, and the DH. And, uh, you know, we, we'll manage it. You know, we've had a lot of experience at doing this, and I think we'll, we'll make our way through. Okay, guys, good to be with you all. Say hello to my mother out there. She's listening from St. James Place. Hello, Mom. Thank <laughs> you.